There's an author called Robert Fisk, right? And when September the 11th happened, he was on a plane uh, going to America from England. And before he got on his plane, the first tower had been hit. And while he was in the air, the second tower had been hit. And then the Pentagon. And he knew the crew on the plane, okay? And Robert Fisk is uh, he's a Middle East correspondent for The Independent in this country. But he's based in Beirut. So he's in the Middle East a lot. And before September the 11th had happened, he had interviewed Osama bin Laden three times. So he knew Osama bin Laden, he knew something was coming. So when he figured out what was going on, and by the, the time the second plane hit the Twin Towers, he had the same indications as everybody else. It's obviously an act of terrorism. And him and another person on the plane were walking around on the plane to look for people they didn't like. And they both came up with roughly the same number, which was 13, 14 people. And they were all Muslim, either having beards, you know, worry beads, reading the Quran, or looking at him because he was looking at them, you know. And that's what Osama bin Laden did. He created, he wasn't separating um, innocence from guilty people. He wasn't separating, you know, the East and the West. He was separating innocence from innocence. And that's what Robert Fisk said. And something else Robert Fisk, Fisk said was, he's not going to let 19 hijackers change his life, and neither should you. That was a clip from a video by a friend of mine called uh, Jovian. He's now on the channel, Iron Colloid. And um, he was actually the first user who ever gave me a shout-out on here. Go and, go, go and subscribe to him. I was in London on the day of the 7-7 terrorist attacks. Staying in North London, been there for about a week. A friend of mine... Uh, called John, his dad died. Uh, not John, the other John. Uh, some other guy I know called John. Um, he's, uh, his dad died in, uh, in the attack. It was funny because before, before 2005, the BNP always pushed anti-Asian, anti-immigrant, anti-black policies. They did these explicitly. That all disappeared after 2005. Nick Griffin didn't want to didn't talk about blacks or Asians or anything like that. The whole language and the culture changed and now it became this idea that uh, it was going to be Muslims. And you won't find black or Asian or any racial terms. They don't use the word race, they now use the word identity. They don't even say the word white people, they say ethnically indigenous. But nothing's changed. Simply by changing their policies to centre around Muslims, they went on to win two seats in the European election. And they gained more ground than they ever had done. They became more popular. This has happened a lot more with um, the EDL. A recent poll, it was by Searchlight magazine, they did a poll and they, realized, they found out that about 50% of this country said they would vote for someone like the BNP or the, you know, the EDL if they weren't so violent. That might be their undoing. But this is what I sort of try and get at because I don't believe anyone out there. Can anyone out there tell me that you honestly believe the agenda of Nick Griffin and the BNP has changed? It just so happens now. The only focus on was they don't care about race anymore. This guy who for so long was denying, that was it Holocaust denier, racist and homophobic st statements all the goddamn time, and anti-immigrant statements, statements about Asians. And by the way, Nick Griffin also met up with Colonel Gaddafi. They wanted to form some sort of uh, nationalist sort of union, which is kind of fucking retarded in and of itself. Jovian mentioned uh, in his video, a video he did, um, it was a response video to David Duke. Now David Duke's another good example. David Duke, for the few of you who probably don't know, David Duke has a YouTube channel, Dr. David Duke. You go look at his videos, he doesn't talk about race, he doesn't talk about any of that. He talks about Israel and Zionism. And the sad thing is, and you go to his videos, they get like, you get the 20 minute videos, I don't watch all, a lot of them, tens of thousands of views, and the videos are all like, the likes are all sort of, you know, he's very, very popular. And it's because people, they, they hear the word Zionism, Israel, and they go for that. Anyone can see, this is David Duke. It doesn't matter what he's, whether what he's saying is actually true, because he, uh, he, he more than likely makes fair points in his videos and states facts about Israel and Zionism. I've got no problem dealing with that. But don't expect me for one minute to give this guy any credence, because I know when he says Israel or Zionist, he's saying Jew. And he just, he's using the language he can to get as many people on side to give him traction so that if, God forbid, one day he gets that power, 
then he can start being honest. Then he can start being sincere about what he says. I understand that listen to the message, not the messenger. Well, I have a problem with that. It doesn't matter how right the message is. If the messenger is David Duke, I've got to sit there and question how honest the message is. You can't just always listen to the message because messages in and of themselves are no good. If you only listen to a message, you, know, you should really care whether the person saying that message is actually sincere and whether once they've got you on their side and got your attention, whether they're going to keep that message consistent, whether they're going to push another message into the fucking background. And messengers are their message. That sort of idea is, is very nice and lovely, but it doesn't really work. I remember being London Underground, sort of in summer of 2007, with about eight people in this tube train, and it was late at night, and this old Muslim guy gets on, uh, gets on one of the stops. You know, quite, to say old, he's like, you know, probably in his like late 50s, possibly like that. You know, the full gear, the, be get, the beard, the cat, the get up, Quran under his shoulder. No one's paying any attention, no one pays any fucking, if you've ever been on London Underground, no one pays any fucking attention to anything that goes on down there. And all of a sudden, the old Muslim guy, he, <coughs> he gets his Quran out. And he opens it, but he just starts going, obviously saying stuff in Arabic, he wasn't like retarded or nothing. And he had his eyes closed and he was rocking back and forth, like, it was like you could just feel the atmosphere in the train, everyone went, Voo! and I was sat opposite him. Like the other seven people were in the different seating compartments out there, and, we're all sat, and I'm sat opposite this geezer, I'm like, I'm going to get the full fucking brunt here. I'm sat there considering converting quickly, just in case, on the off chance, right? Everyone else, and I look and sort of look to my right, and everyone else, and he's still going, everyone else is looking at me going, I'm thinking, I'm thinking it was just this tension, and, and the guy's still going, suddenly, he just stops, and he looks up, and he goes, Boom! I just nearly shit. <laughs> this moment passed when I was like, and everyone in the tube then just started giggling, and then he started giggling. He's like, <laughs> I was like, you fucking cheeky bastard. You know when you sort of know you've been pranked and you're embarrassed to laugh. You want to be. I thought, what's he going to do next? He's going to get like a backpack and go on a go on a train, like just go Allah Akbar and pull the cord, and this big thing's going to come out and unfold, saying boom, you know, for the fundamentalist Muslim with a sense of humour. And I remember it in just that, that moment, and I thought it's a shame, really, that there's only eight people here to experience that. And it was like at that moment, it was like, oh. and ever since then. Even though I didn't have much fear beforehand, ever since then, I just thought, I can't take, th I, can't, I can't live like this. People say, yeah, I am scared, I'm sitting there and I'm scared, and I'm like, you know what, yeah, okay, I get that, if that's what you think. I understand that, you know, everyone's got being blown up a phobia. You've got to get the train, you've got to get the bus. If someone's going to blow you up, it's going to happen, unless you want to start walking everywhere. That's the risk you have to take. If, if that happens to me, I'm not going to have much time to think about it. I'll have, like, the point two seconds before I'm turned into flying fucking mints. That's going to happen. It's going to happen. Same way someone's going to stab me late at night. It's going to happen. Someone's going to beat me up and steal my wallet. It's going to happen. Because if it, if it happens, I want to sit there and go, well, at least I was, at least I enjoyed myself and relaxed. Rather than, shit, I've lived my life in absolute abject terror this entire fucking time, and it's fucking happened anyway. It got me nowhere. Go, go subscribe to Jovian, Switchley Coughlin, Triple Zero. Good night, mate. God bless.